Ah, you see the the difficulty with this is the the on the on the video. I mean on the what's sent out. If you can't see. Do you, know, do you know if I can uh, turn off the taskbar? Uh, yeah, if you like. Well, can I can I use the uh, <laughs> that voice? Uh, it doesn't show here. So we're just starting. Okay. Oh, can you check with the phone? Yeah, yeah. And can I check with the phone? That works. Yes. And this works, but I, I can't make a I can't make a third therapy event. Never mind. Okay, welcome everyone to the to the sports seminar. Apologies for the unusual location, but thanks a lot for showing up. We're very happy to have uh, Professor Emeritus of Statistics from Leiden University, Dr. Richard Gill. And uh, well, he's, uh, he's an expert in many things. He's very passionate about quantum physics, and uh, he is known to free serial killer nurses who are accused of uh, <laughs> murdering their patients. So I think today's talk is also about something related. So, I mean, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And it's fantastic to be here again. As, uh, like I was here when you were founded. I, I was not one of the founding fathers. I was one of the sons of the founding fathers. There were not many ladies in those days, which was sad. OK, and I had a great time here and I was supposed to be running a, a group on, on complex statistical models. But actually, I was working on quantum mechanics and uh, mis misleading people, which is what I usually do instead of leading them. Right. Uh, what? what? Yeah, but, oh, misleading judges. That's from my. Well, OK, judges are difficult people. So sorry. So uh, uh, at the moment, I'm kind of full time. Well, since I retired seven years ago, and since then, I've never worked as I mean, I've been working harder than I ever worked in my life, though not, not only on science things. Um, uh, the main thing I've been working on really this last seven years is uh, uh, connected to the case of this lady whose name is Lucy Letby. And you sort of don't take any notice of this, but that's just so that I remember where I got the pictures from. Uh, I mean, this one comes from this own girl's uh, Facebook page. Right. And uh, this one uh, and, and this and this one is sort of fairly recent. And this is the case I'm going to talk mainly about. It's the case of a nurse called Lucy Letby. Lucy Letby. And that she's in England and she works at a hospital whose name I will probably mention a few times, called the Countess of Chester, Countess of Chester Hospital, C-O-C-H, Countess of Chester. And it's a, like a 50-year-old hospital in the grounds of what used to be the stately home of uh, the Countess and the Count, obviously, of Chester, which is a small town uh, not far from Liverpool, not far from the Welsh border. So it's in England, but it's in the north uh, west, not far from Wales, not far from North Wales. But that's this lady, and this is when she was still happy. And I would give you a little timeline of, of what became what happened to her. But well, I can tell you right now, at the moment, uh, uh, suspicions were raised. She like so I guess at this time she was like studying to be a nurse, or maybe she already was a nurse and she was having a night out with her with her friends in the pub and um, uh, uh, at a certain point of time in 2015 she became a fully qualified nurse and she was moved into a particular department of the Countess of Chester Hospital namely the neonatal ward so where the young babies are and it's actually a neonatal intensive care unit in my CU so it's with Babies who have been born but are in difficulty and need to go in an incubator or whatever. I mean, breathing apparatus, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, so actually, that means it's a ward in a hospital where actually many babies die. Unfortunately, and we'll see the numbers in a moment because they're going to be important. I, I mean, not most of them don't, but uh, uh, the babies which are born prematurely or with birth defects or whatever or whatever, they may survive a few days or weeks even, and uh, the doctors will work hard to try to save them if it's possible, and the nurses too, obviously, but some of them won't make it. Uh, and the, the neonatal ward is, uh, I think it's the floor below the maternity ward, which is where the mothers come to give birth, actually. They're, they're sort of close by. There's a, a, a lift or and some corridors or some stairs or whatever in between. That's going to be important. Now, in the 2015, she, she um, was uh, fully qualified and started working in the neonatal unit. And uh, uh, she t this, she said she's everybody thought she was quite a rather nice girl, but she's somebody described her as a bit of a madame, which means to say she's the kind of person who points things out when she thinks that things are not being done properly. And very rapidly, uh, she got a number of the senior doctors on that ward completely pissed off. With that so <laughs> so in a in a hospital like that you have uh, you have some in England they would be called senior consultants which and this means they are doctors who actually have a private practice as doctors uh, in this ward in this unit they would be they are pediatricians and like care of young children well care of children but they're caring for very very young children here but they only kind of come in once a week and then they do a rounds, do the rounds, see all the patients, like the babies, babies in incubators and so on, or in uh, with uh, uh, getting oxygen and food through pipes. Uh, they they go around and they look at the medical notes and they advise the younger doctors and, and the younger doctors give instructions to the nurses and the nurses do an awful lot of work. Um, so what I was saying was, so uh, uh, she was the someone who actually, every time she thought things were wrong, uh, she filled in forms, pointing them out, like to management, like actually everybody's supposed to do. But people who do are often found to be troublesome by uh, senior people in the hospital, naturally. So uh, she really got a number of this, these senior uh, consulting pediatricians pretty pissed off and they started asking management to take her off the ward because she was like, you know, spoiling the atmosphere. Uh, and but as, but as the year went by, 2015, and then it went into 2016, uh, let's uh, go ahead straight away. And I, I will come back and tell you more about Lucia later. This is a Dutch nurse, and this is like 20 years ago or 20 years before. And it's like the same story. But because these things don't only happen in England, they also happen in other countries, <laughs> and they happened in the Netherlands. And this is a, a, a nurse called Lucia, Lucia de Berg. And I think this is even before she became a nurse, photograph taken by a friend of hers. Actually, she was a cleaning lady at the time, and her friend, she cleaned in the house of a friend, and the friend advised her to become a nurse. So she became a nurse, but then in a short time, she became. Netherlands' worst ever female serial killer in 2000. And, well, she was arrested. She was arrested in 2001, and um, uh, so uh, and there was a trial in 2000, uh, 2001, 2003, and there were appeals, and another trial in 2004, and it went to the Supreme Court 2005. Uh, and in 2005, she was uh, definitively in jail for life for seven murders and three attempted murders. And actually, everybody believed she'd killed many more, but they hadn't got the sort of the legal evidence. And everybody knew she was an evil witch. And at that moment, a kind of movement started. A couple of people who, with inside knowledge of the hospital, actually, and, um, uh, and one of them a scientist, also one of them a doctor, got started agitating. Well, first of all, they, they, they started going to the authorities and saying this is all wrong. And they had good reasons to do that. 
and the, the authorities said, sorry, we can't do anything about it. You know? uh, but one of them wrote a book and the book appeared in the bookshops and people started talking about it. And a friend of mine read it and wrote, uh, wrote me a letter. I was working on quantum mechanics in Denmark. Uh, and uh, he said to me, Richard, this uh, book has come out. This and this case is it was a, it was a witch hunt, and and now and then it was a witch trial. And and if Professor Dirksen's book, if, and if you believe like the first twenty pages of it, and it's like I don't know, one hundred fifty or two hundred pages. You only have to read the first ten pages to see that they really screwed up, and she's quite likely innocent. And he was going to write a letter to the authorities, and that was Peter Grunwald. Some of you may know him. He was. Uh, was uh, one of my first postdocs here in Urandum. Well, I recognized his talent very early. I took, I'm proud of to say. And he, and he, he emailed me, uh, Richard, will you, uh, have you heard about the nurse, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to write a letter to dot, dot, dot. And, and it would be good if you would put your name on it too, because, you know, member of Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences, blah, blah. So, you know, I'm not boasting, it's just, these things happen and then you can use them. Uh, but of course, I had to read the book first. So I did. And then I got furious. I got so furious because uh, the, the um, judges had told us that this lady had been convicted on the basis of indisputable scientific medical evidence. Only, not statistics. So people kept saying to me, it's nothing to do with statistics. What are you doing with it, Richard? But the thing is, uh, the guy who wrote the book showed that uh, like amateur wrong statistical thinking permeated the case from beginning to end, that one, and had they really influenced the judgments of, of medical experts. Like there were two medical experts who said uh, two separate patients. Well, normally I would have thought this was a normal death. But since she was there every time when people died, and she's a bit of a suspicious person, you know, I, but I believe this is a, a, a not a natural death, right? That was a medical, that was indisputable scientific medical evidence, according to Dutch judges, right? I got curious. I was angry because uh, my wife had already said in 2003, so uh, when we first heard about this one in the news, was in 2001. She'd already said in 2001, Richard, there's a, there's, a, there's a witch hunt going on in The Hague. And I wasn't watching the news much in those days. Uh, and I was interested in quantum mechanics and so on. So, <laughs> and, and then in 2003, there was reporting in the newspapers about the trial. And my wife said, Richard, remember that nurse? Now it's a, a witch trial. And they're using statistics because in 2003, there was a statistical calculation and an old friend of mine who I used to have very high regard for um, came up with a number one in 342 million as being the chance of uh, her being there so often when things happened, if, you was, if it was just chance, right? The chance of so, such an extreme pattern, assuming the pattern was a random pattern, right? So he said, he said to the judges, uh, this is not, this is not a coincidence. It, it, it's not chance. I can't tell you what the cause is, but that you, that's up to you, of course. And he mentioned some possible causes. He mentioned, well, maybe, maybe she was just a bad nurse. And, you know, she killed those people. They were both babies and old people. So several hospitals. Maybe you, maybe she killed them, you know, just because she was a, by accident because she was a bad nurse. And the judges asked Lucia, were you a bad nurse? And she said, no, no, you know, all my, you know, in all my evaluations, they found me very good. And, and, and you know, and another reason would be, uh, which the statistician had thought of and told to the court, well, uh, of course, maybe she has more difficult shifts than the other nurses. And so the judges asked Lucia, here on the left, did you have more difficult shifts than the other, than your colleagues? And she said, no, we shared them all equally, fairly. Well, now the thing uh, that's a bit subtle, 
she was comparing herself to similar nurses, full-time, fully, fully qualified nurses. Those are the ones who shared shifts equally, you know, shared the hard, the bad, difficult ones and the easy ones and so on and so forth. Uh, but the the statistics put, con considered all the nurses as being the same, including the part time nurses, right, and the learner nurses. So uh, uh, anyway, but uh, uh, all right. So uh, yeah, and th that's why I was so angry because my wife had told me to get involved in this case because there were statistics in it, and then I believed the judges that there was no statistics in it. And then I found out that they had lied to us. Right? They had lied to us. Now, this, there's a lot of similarity with this one. I guess it's uh, time to look at a slide because I'm getting. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, it's this button. Um, right. uh, sorry, my talks are always very chaotic, as is in my life. <laughs> uh, and I like it that way, <laughs> as people say. Yeah. In fact, even Lucia said so. She said to my wife, is, is, she, is he always like this? And they looked at it one another knowingly. Yes. OK, uh, so uh, here's a little, here's some numbers. There are not very many of them. And the, this, this is a data which actually got, was got from uh, a Freedom of Information request in England. And this is about Lucy Letby now. I will tell you more about Lucy Letby pretty soon um, about the sequence of events in England, which is what this talk is really about, what's going on in England. Um, here we have early neonatal deaths and here we have late neonatal deaths. And there are some and, and these are official categories which are filled in in, in data, which is submitted to the national, the NHS, National Health Service. UK is so proud of being the first country ever which had a universal free health service. Fantastic innovation of, of uh, the left wing, you know, the Labour Party in the uh, early 20s, I think. And they're so proud of it and they underfund it. And the right wing Tory government really wants it all privatised. But it's a bit difficult because it's an icon of the Britishness, the NHS, our NHS. Uh, but anyway, these are official statistics. Uh, that means that, that means you probably can't believe them, by the way. I mean, not because of any conspiracy, but because of definitions and odd things and errors made by people, the managers who fill in forms and submit them in computer systems. And if you look at, uh, for, uh, as I now know, having studied a number of these cases, you will find out that if you go to whatever official source you like, the numbers will be different. I mean, they will be close, but they will be different because of for all kinds of reasons. So here, early neonatal deaths and late neonatal deaths. OK, look, and we will not talk about the post. And actually, these are what are called in the newspapers. These are called the deaths. Because, I mean, they, they shouldn't. Uh, these ones, uh, late fetal loss I and mean, stillbirth. Uh, uh, I mean, these are this is in the ordinary languages are miscarriages and these are stillbirths. I don't know if anybody wants that translated into Dutch, but um, I mean, this, this so like this is a, a baby which is born dead, and this is a baby which is born sort of so too early that it dies almost straight away. And so these these ones we are not talking about. So actually, I will talk a little bit about them for uh, and in, uh, for, particularly for this reason. Look at that big number there. Well, these are these numbers are all big too. Look at that, how big they are, and look at this one, how big that one is. Okay, but anyway, these are still births, so sort of, this has got nothing to do with nurses, and sort of, this has got nothing to do with doctors. But, but you would be mistaken to think so. I'll explain why in a moment. So, uh, okay, we, this is sort of after not so many weeks, we don't call it. A, a, we're not counting it. And here's all deaths, but this is what like the newspapers think of as being the deaths on the neonatal ward. Four and four in in 2013 and 2014, then nine and eight, and then four and two. 
and then the newspapers will say, and what happened here? Well, and what happened here? Lucy Letby came on the ward. 1st of January 2015. Uh, what happened in 2016? She was suspended halfway through the year. She was only on the ward half the year. Uh, and OK. And uh, among these nine and eight are, um, I think, uh, seven for which she's now serving life sentences. Right? She's supposed to have murdered seven of these babies. And she's also supposed to have, have made murderous attacks on many more babies. I'll tell you some more about that in a moment. Now, actually, <laughs> I mean, um, so talking about correlation and causation, uh, there are more things which happened uh, at about this boundary. For one thing, uh, well, oh, well, maybe I'll tell that later because let's let's move on. So uh, you will soon hear that there are more things which changed between 2016 and 2017. OK, Lucy is no longer on the ward from, from about July 2016, but more things changed then. And an interesting question is actually, did anything change here at all? apart from Lucia coming from the ward. Now, actually, one thing I wanted to do, but I haven't put it on the slides now, is to, to run a little R script where I, I, I take, uh, for instance, uh, uh, six independent Poisson four numbers and show you the six. And actually, you'll see a pattern like this pretty often. <laughs> so, like, I mean, uh, really, uh, it's not clear. So, what, and anybody could, can do that and find out for themselves. It's not clear from a statistical point of view that there's anything happening here at all. And this column here is also suspicious because allegedly Lucy has got nothing to do with stillbirths and so on, but there were an awful lot in 2015 and in 2017. Both those numbers are big. Uh, and there's another thing, and that is that if a death occurs of a newborn baby within six days, it can be reclassified as a stillbirth. And that has uh, certain advantages. I mean, it's tragic, of course. Uh, the parents might prefer it. They might prefer to say their baby was born then. Uh, it means it's not a death, which means there's not a post-mortem. The parents might prefer that too. Do you want your little baby you were looking forward to cut up and put together again a song? No, you know, probably don't. Uh, doctors often prefer that. That's a bit more sinister. But we have proof of that. But, uh, but anyway, what I'm saying is that some of these numbers could just as well have been put in that column. So th this, these categories are, are, are bureaucratic categories. And these numbers, I'm not saying they're fictions, but they're, bu they're numbers produced by a bureaucratic system. People filling in forms and applying certain categories and certain definitions. And definitions keep changing from time to time and in different places. Uh, OK, so let's look at the next slide. So this is. Uh, um, uh, Oh, but, oh, sorry. Yeah, what I wanted to say is this this did set things off because actually everybody working in that hospital or on that ward, both the doctors and the managers did notice this. They were certainly aware that there were suddenly more deaths in, in, on the neonatal ward. And um, uh, actually, I'll tell you straight away what one of the things was that changed here. They reclassified they change the um, uh, sort of the level of the ward, which determines how difficult cases are allowed to be enter into the ward. You have like level one, level two, level three. Level three would be a, a top uh, university teaching hospital with state of the art facilities, blah, 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 blah. Right. Level two is in between and level one is like your local not village hospital, but a small town hospital, which is not allowed to do really difficult things because they don't have the facilities. They're supposed to be sent off 
to the nearest big level uh, three hospital. Uh, at this point, actually, in uh, the same time that Lucy was taken off the ward, the hospital was lowered in its classification. So actually, from here onwards, uh, the, the the cases are not so difficult. There are no more there are no more premature triplets and premature twins, and no more severe, in, in very very premature babies at all because they're all going to Liverpool, to big hospital in Liverpool. And actually, before this, like around about here, I don't know what, this little hospital, Countess of Chester, was fighting for survival because it was too small. And they did a big publicity campaign to get more patients to come in to stop them from being, to keep it going there in Chester. And actually, uh, uh, this, this girl actually appeared on the brochure which they printed and on posters, you know, not this picture, I think I hasten to add, but a picture of her with a little baby, part of an advertising campaign to bring in more patients to keep the hospital open. So, um, yeah, that is, uh, whoops, this one, yes. So uh, somewhere around here, the, pay, the, the, the unit was upgraded and started getting more different difficult cases. Now, another thing which you don't see here anyway, and of course, you should all have already thought of it, is you don't see the total number of patients coming into the hospital, the total number of births in, in the units, well, in the nearby maternity unit, right? the maternity unit, neonatal intensive care unit. So uh, these numbers anyway have to be related to the, the, the population they are taken from, which is like mothers coming into the hospital or well, births in the hospital. And um, uh, actually, if you do do that, then it becomes less clear, but still apparent that something is something may be wrong there. All right. Now, OK, now I'm kind of jumping right into the trial, uh, because now I'm going to show you three pieces of evidence uh, the three pieces of evidence which the prosecute so um, okay I mean she's now in jail for life Lucy uh, and uh, she was when was she arrested well she was uh, taken into custody for questioning in, in 2018 and in 2019 but released again and in 2020 she was arrested then because of corona the tr trial was postponed two years so she has been in jail since 2000, uh, 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 well, yeah, in, yeah, essentially in jail since uh, 2019. Did I say that, or did I, should I say 2020? 2019, 17, 18, 19, yeah, since 2019, and it's now 2023, so that's five years later, and we've only had one trial, just like at the, the first level trial. Uh, they, they do things a bit differently in England. Uh, uh, anyway, um, and um, uh, actually, I think that right now in this Lucy Letby case, we are halfway. Uh, her terrible, supposing she's innocent, I think she is actually, but uh, what I do know for sure is her, her uh, uh, trial was grossly unfair and her uh, and the police investigation was grossly incompetent. I will say that, if not even worse. I mean, I think, well, maybe I'm, um, the police actually are very scared of me. They they actually uh, uh, they actually the centre uh, got in touch with Appledorn Police, and Appledorn Police came to visit my house in the night to deliver a letter telling me to take down my blog and remove. All posts on my social media, which I did lot. <laughs> you know, I'm retired, so what else can you do? <laughs> you know, on my uh, Twitter tweets and Facebook stuff. Social community boards there. I didn't, no, I didn't get anti social. Uh, well, uh, it is heard before that police in England sent out these letters. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They sent them out to four people, each of whom had a, a website with. Material which they didn't want anybody to know. Right. Yes, strange. Yeah, it was. 
this fascism. It's a first stage of fascism, but it actually it's it's stupidity and incompetence. Right, the police are convinced they have done the biggest thing which police have done in England for a long time, which is a good thing because the police are highly criticized in England. I mean, it's just like the NHS. It's a the police, the people have a love hate relationship with their institutions and the police uh, are screwing up again and again, too. And everybody knows that. But still, uh, the police, you know, and like we had the first police, obviously, you know, like England invented everything, right? But they were first with everything. Well, um, but I mean, I think it's mostly incompetence. But of course, to be a to be a policeman heading to be a, a, a detective chief inspector running an investigation into what might be the most serious evil female serial killer in English history, and you have 60 to 70 people working for you for six years, uh, it means you're convinced she's evil, right? I mean, it means you you must be convinced. You, you, you trust your policeman's instinct, and there's a whole lot riding on getting this conviction and keeping it. And they have got funding for the next three years looking for another hundred. Yeah, tell more about that in a moment. OK, so uh, anyway, anyway, so actually I, I predict that Lucy will be probably in jail uh, until uh, for another eight years, by which time I'll be 80. I don't know if I'll be there. My wife says I'll have Alzheimer's. But it, it doesn't matter. I mean, I can carry on this till I drop dead one way or another. Um, uh, OK, so what I so the, the trial was an inc incredibly long trial. It was one of the longest trials in British history, perhaps the longest, the biggest one. There was so much evidence like, you know, they have to get get a van and put piles and piles of boxes in it just to sort of take the evidence around the paper evidence so much. And um, the, the trial lasted. The uh, trial lasted eight months and the jury took a month to decide. This is unheard of. Eight months, a trial going on for eight months. Now, during those eight months, the jury are not allowed to look at social media. They shouldn't even read the newspapers, you know. Well, I can read the newspapers, but not the articles about the case. They're not allowed to go to Wikipedia and look things up about all the medical stuff they're being told. Um, they're supposed to decide based on the common sense. That's the British system. Um, and uh, somebody was telling me, actually, he, he is an engineer and he had been asked to be a juror. Just sort of at random in America in his career. Like 20 times and he'd been taken off the jury. 18 times because he was qualified. Right. I mean, the case had got something to do with science, so you can't have an engineer. You can't have a, you know, like a professor on a jury in America. That's in America. But the system is pretty thick there too. Anyway, so so I, I will explain. I won't say much about all the rest of the evidence because it would take us eight months to go through it, right? And uh, and in my opinion, it's totally uninteresting but of course I'll, most of the uh, uh, English people who been, uh, who have been following this trial and many people are obsessed by serial murder there's a lot of obsession with murder and especially serial murder and there are people who follow every day the reporting from the trial because there are there are journalists going to the trial they are allowed only to write uh, what they heard, right? They're not allowed to give any opinions because they should just report. But what they report is, of course, a dumbed down version of what they heard in as far as they understood it, and then dumbed down even more so that the readers of the Daily Mail and the Express and so on can think they understand it. So, uh, and the, during these nine months, the prosecution barrister, that's the guy with the wig and a crown, who's speaking for the prosecution, um, he is basically playing to the public. It's, it's theatre. It's, it's like a wrestling match. It, it's a, 
bread and circuses. Right? It's a big entertainment. And, and it's like a wrestling match, and you have these two guys wearing these funny clothes. It's like a wrestling match. Okay, well, maybe they wear almost no clothes, but it's the same thing. They're wearing a special uh, wrestling match uniform with a black gown and, and a thing here and a wig and, uh, from the 18th century. Uh, and uh, and they are kind of fighting one another and they're cross-examining. Okay, I mean, they're very good at tricking people. They're very good at tricking people up on their words, uh, getting people to contradict themselves, right? So the barrister can question Lucy and ask her what happened then and what happened then and tries to trick her into making uh, into inconsistencies in what she says. And the defence barrister does the same thing in the other direction. So he tries to trick up the defence experts. Also, all the experts belong to one side or the other side. They are instructed either by the prosecution or by the defence. And though they're strictly speaking supposed to speak as experts, which means to be independent and sort of scientific, they actually have been got all their information for one side, from one side, and they're paid by one side. And so this leads to corruption, I would say. Uh, yeah. Now, OK, so there were like uh, nine months of evidence and then and a lot of it is utterly trivial things which a lot of people focus on. Look, she lied. Look, first she said that and then she said that. First, she said that when she was arrested, she was wearing her pajamas. And then she said when she was arrested, she was wearing a jumpsuit or something. I mean, right. So she's a liar. Yeah. Now, is that important? Uh, what do you think you would remember of your arrest a number of years earlier when you're totally traumatized? But it's, that, that's the kind of thing that went on in these nine months. But there were three pieces of evidence which start, stood out. And they were shown to the court in, on the first day by the prosecution, as soon, like, as soon as the prosecution could say anything. And they, the prosecution showed it again on the last day. And the newspapers reported it. And the judge gave permission uh, that this document was released to the newspapers, right? Almost the scientific evidence presented in court is not public in England. Uh, after the trial, if you've got a lot of money, you can buy it. I mean, buy it, get a copy of it, because ultimately it becomes public domain, but it costs a lot of money to get it. And uh, they don't want to, and they're not going to give it for a long time. Why? I'll explain why in a month. Anyway, so this is a piece of scientific evidence, as you see, because it's a spreadsheet. And this is, uh, this is the, one of the star ex exhibits of the Cheshire Constabulary. And they have been boasting about it. And the, um, recently, this piece, and this was shown in the, to, to, this was given to the release to the media. Now, what do you see here? Here you see all the nurses, and here's Lucy. Her surname begins with an L, that's why she's here. Oh, no, no, they ordered by first name. L for Lucy. Anyway, she's in the middle because she's in the middle of the alphabet. And look, there's a cross all the way down, and it's marked purple, so you cannot fail to miss it. And uh, here are all the other nurses. Now, what is this? It says child A down to child Q. Uh, but actually, this really should be, it's not a list of children, but a list of, of um, sort of cases or accusations. Uh, some of these are deaths. Some of these are, are, re are thought by the prosecution to be attacks. So these are attacks on babies and deaths of babies. Where the prosecution has evidence which they think shows that Lucy did it. So these are the evil deeds of Lucy, according to the prosecution. And now, would you be surprised that she's there every time? <laughs> I mean, would you be surprised that some nurses are only there very infrequently? Yes, uh, uh, Vicky Lamaya, she was only there too. Look, police can count. They got the numbers at the bottom. They're all small, and this one is big. Uh, this evidence was recently shown on one of uh, BBC's star 
doc, uh, um, yeah, current affairs programs, which that's really good. It's called it's called Panorama. It's like every week, and they do really really good shows about important things. And uh, after Lucy was convicted, uh, they had their documentary on the Lucy Ledby case. Now we know that those journalists had been following the case uh, ten months and actually uh, collecting material and probably not didn't have an opinion. I mean, they it, it's a bit like uh, I I can't remember. Uh, like you don't know yet whether who's going to win the election, but you have lots of material and then somebody wins and then you make a documentary explaining why they won. Right. So as soon as Lucy Letby was convicted, they were ready with the documentary explaining why she was convicted and explaining that she was an evil witch and that the police had been so fantastic to catch her and everything is wonderful in this wonderful country. And they put this, this was shown on TV a few weeks ago. And, and so this, this, this table convinces seasoned journalists. Isn't that, uh, isn't that shocking? I, I know lots of ordinary people saw this and said that but this is, I mean, not lots, uh, but, uh, but you don't have to have a university degree to see that this is bullshit and circular, right? So this cannot be an important piece of evidence. And that the police think it's an important piece of evidence tells us something about the police, their intelligence, right? Right. Okay. Now, th th this item and two other items uh, keep being spoken about again and again. I have to watch the time. It always happens. I know too much about this. Uh, I'll show you two more. Uh, I mean, like th this is, <laughs> I mean, this is the statistics in this case, right? It's a police spreadsheet, which is totally dumb, but which convinced everybody. Right. Uh, here's the other thing which is so important. So Lucy collected, it was a, like a hoarder. She collected pieces of paper and she kept them in boxes under her bed. Now, it's very strange that somebody who knows that the police are going to arrest her has a huge, has some boxes under her bed with a note saying that she did it, as well as papers taken from the hospital, which she shouldn't have. So she's evil. This, now, um, yeah, OK. And you see it's uh, OK. And this picture was in the newspapers. The judge allowed this to be put in the public domain. On day one of the trial. Uh, it, several people have worked hard to try to figure out what's written here, and I'll show you that straight away. And the important thing is, like it says, I did this, but what she actually wrote was, they accused me, they went, I did this, I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough to care for them, I'm a horrible evil person. It's what the police were saying about her, at least you can interpret it that way. But you don't know. Uh, she doesn't deserve mum and dad. The world is better off without me. And Tom and Matt. Uh, she thinks she's bad because she has brought her family into such a terrible situation. And and uh, she doesn't know. She thinks she must be a bad nurse because she let the babies die. I'm an awful person. I pay every day for that. Kill myself right now. I'll never have children. I'll never know what to have family. Hate myself. This is a woman in a suffering extreme in extreme depression, a PTSD, and considering killing herself. And we know when it was written, and, and she had been at that time subject of vicious persecution for two or three years. So this is what that does to you being persecuted for three years and being put into a hopeless position and no and you know, lots of people not believing in so on. Police investigation, slander, discrimination, victimization, all getting too much, everything, taking over my life every day. I feel very lonely, scared. What does the future hold? How can I get through it? How did things ever be like? I don't deserve to live. OK, but uh, so the police think that this is 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 the definitive evidence because this is a confession. Now, I need lawyer can tell you that this is not a confession. Because it's. Uh, it's not a confession. A confession is you write, say you did it, and you sign your name, and there's a policeman there. That is a confession. Uh, and interestingly, 
nobody asked to asked to have a handwriting specialist or a psychologist to look at this which is uh, stunning really i mean why did the defense not ask for that uh, i'll talk about the defense again in a moment um but i mean christ this is just the middle ages really uh, and uh, this uh, reconstruction was done by a guy on, on Twitter. And so many good things have been done by amateurs during those nine months. When actually in England, nobody was allowed to talk about it at all. Right. Here's the third item. Oh, <laughs> okay. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk very much about this. It's insulin. And just to sort of warm up, uh, there are lots of different ways to measure insulin. And um, but uh, OK, so you I mean, all right, there's something called a mole, which is actually just a number of molecules. So OK, it's a, a big number of molecules. I think that's avocado is a big number. But anyway, a mole is a number of molecules. And OK, and then we have pico, nano, micro, milli, p, n, mu and m. So you can talk about p moles, n moles, mu moles and m moles. And you can talk about p moles per ml per milliliter and so on and sometimes you do talk about per liter and so on and so forth probably in england they still use pints i don't know but um anyway uh numbers are very confusing here because there are lots of different ways to express the same thing and then there's another way called a u uh, which was initially defined i found this really funny the amount of insulin required to cause convulsive hypovolemia in a fasted two kilogram rapid rapid <laughs> not a fast one a fast i i starved i mean it's been starved until it's like about to drop dead of hunger and then you find out how much insulin <laughs> really put into it gives it convulsions and of course kills it that was what the u was Sometimes it's called an IU or sometimes an SU, and it's defined, been redefined a number of times. And nowadays it's defined in terms of the mole. Uh, but I can't remember what the what the uh, uh, factor is. <laughs> anyway, now the thing is, okay, insulin is a hormone, and it controls your blood sugar level. And you uh, and if your blood sugar level is too low, you may faint, you know, and you have and you are suffer from I always forget which is which hypoglycemia. That means too Hypo low. Hypo, Hypo is yeah. low because you have hypo costs under the floor, floor central heating. The Romans had hypo costs, which was essentially which probably gave them carbon monoxide poisoning. And hypoglycemia is too much, but also bad. Too little, too much. Glucose. Okay? And glucose is not the insulin. And there's something else as well. And that's uh, called a C peptide. And the jurors were convinced by the insulin to C peptide ratio on two babies, two of the babies, like this A, B to up to Z or something. Get how many. And um, what you have to know is that when your body is making your own insulin, for you, which it needs, it's a hormone, it's needed to go into your bloodstream and make other things happen in other places in your body. Uh, it makes the insulin from something else, which I forget what its name is, some other molecule, something you eat, you know, and that thing is split into two molecules. Like there's a long amino acid thing and it's split into two. And one of them is insulin and the other thing is a C peptide. And of course, your body makes equal numbers of those two molecules because it is made just by splitting them, splitting another. And then various processes going on in your body and the C peptides are not used. So they break down and get recycled or whatever. The amino acids get recycled and the insulin is used for your uh, to control your blood sugar. And it also gets broken down and used up and new stuff gets made and so on. But anyway. Baby F had four, six, five, seven P moles per litre, but it only had one, six, nine P moles per litre of C peptide. Yeah, so it had a lot of insulin and a little amount. Now, actually, it turns out that if you would have this amount of insulin in your body now, you would probably die in three hours. So this number 
Uh, this number is very suspicious for all kinds of reasons. I mean, this is a, the concentration of insulin in your blood, which will kill you quite fast. Yeah, if it starts. Right yes, down. right. OK, OK. And there was another baby. Now, and an interesting thing is that this was a baby which was in intensive care. It was being. It had uh, insulin problems. It had blood sugar problems. It was being continuously modified, mo uh, monitored. This blood sugar level was being continuously mo monitored, almost continuously monitored. At the time that this test was done, uh, glucose, OK, that's blood sugar, right? Was 1.3 mol per liter. And two hours later, it was 4 mols per liter. So, and right, the baby is still alive today, by the way. This baby was not poisoned by an enormous injection, which is very difficult to do in a tiny premature baby, of a huge amount of insulin. But this convinced the jurors. And a really sad, and another baby too. And look at this. Please note that the insulin assay is not suitable for investigation of factitious hypoglycemia. That means hypoglycemia, which means too high blood sugar caused by being given insulin, which would be uh, like hospital insulin, which is made synthetically or comes from pigs or something. But uh, it, it, if somebody, it, this is the test description belonging to those numbers done in Liverpool in the lab. And it says that if you think that the baby is suffering from hypoglycemia, oh, sorry, too little high, too little, yeah, too low blood sugar because of because it's been given too much insulin. Uh, then tell the laboratory and we will give it to somebody else to measure. Uh, this evidence should not have been allowed. How the did the defense lawyers agreed in advance that they would not contest this evidence? They forced Lucy herself to believe that there was a murderer on the ward. This is so incredible. Right. Okay. I'm just going to move on. Yes. Now, obviously, there was a lot more. And uh, here's a little bit of history, which is important. I'll try to go very fast now. Between 2000, yeah, during 2015 and 2016, there were big conflicts at the hospital between the management and the medical consultants and the nurses. Everyone had noticed alarming rise in death rates. They seemed to often happen in Lucy Letby's shifts. She thought they would seem to happen often in her shifts. She worked more than in hours than any other nurse there. So, of course, they would do anyway. But she seemed to feel that they kept happening when she was there. The Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health did an investigation, end of 2016, wrote a fact report, uh, kept it secret, I mean, submitted it to the hospital and so on, and finally published uh, a version of it, shortened version of it, and it blames the nurses, no, sorry, it blames the doctors for a falling situation in that ward. And, uh, okay, but it, and it says, uh, some of the incidents, we can't understand them, so we suggest or we recommend a forensic a forensic investigation, not a police investigation, a forensic investigation. But now, during that fight between management and the medical consultants, the medical consultants were blaming the nurses, of course, and Lucy in particular, and they wanted to report her to the police and the uh, management forbade them to do it and they and as a result of this report the management ordered the doctors to apologize to nurse Lucy Letby and I think they actually did but uh, then they went to the police anyway and um, you know well there's a lot of things I can tell you there which I won't now right well I'll just tell you I certainly must tell you this now a funny thing happened it was announced in the newspapers and then suddenly a guy turned up at Cheshire Police Station called Dewey Evans, who's a retired paediatrician. 
he had not been a doctor, consulting doctor, for 15 years. He did have a firm uh, doing medical uh, consultation uh, in legal cases of contested, contested paternity, like when mum says that dad has been beating up the babies, children, or vice versa. Then he offered his services, and he is has been strongly uh, um, criticised by judges for his utterly bad scientific behaviour, because he's a, a charlatan, I would say. Police gave him the notes of 32 incidents. And, um, right. Um, okay. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, the trial, blah, blah, blah. Heard all this. Uh, okay, just heard all this. Okay, I should tell you a little bit about the rise in the number of deaths as a natural explanation. Uh, Lucy had only one witness, and he was a plumber. He was actually a, an Italian plumber. That's surprising to me. I thought plumbers were usually Polish. He was an Italian plumber, uh, and he had been frequently called to the... Oh, yeah, okay, I can make it. Uh, uh, well, no, I shouldn't make the incorrect jokes. But um, uh, he, he was, he'd been called to the, those two wards by eight times during that period to deal with so-called sewage backflow issues. For instance, the maternity ward was once awash with shit. Uh, and, okay. Um, and the rise in number of deaths has a natural explanation. Uh, uh, okay, lots of people have looked at this now, and it is very clear that a number of them had acute uh, 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 septicemia, so septic, I mean, they, di they basically they died of rapid bacterial, possibly viral infection of internal organs, and probably the, the blame should be put on the hygienic situation there, which was appalling. Um, a couple died for other reasons. I mean, the, the, like all of the deaths have a completely natural explanation, though in many cases it's clear that the doctors were not supervising, the senior doctors were not supervising the lower doctors and the lower doc and the nurses were being you know, doing things which they, were, for instance, resuscitating babies too many times too vigorously, which damages them. But I mean, if there's nobody else there. Right, okay. Uh, okay, I, well, lots of things are going on now, and I guess I should just stop now. Um, uh, I, w I want to mention this. How did th those... Oh, you can't stop me. I wrap down. But, uh, okay, I wrap down. Like, I, I, I've tried to have nothing to do whatever with this case all the time, because I already did some nurses, and I want other people to take it over now. But a very important thing which every statistician knows is you must find out how the data was gathered. Now, I have not been saying that in this case, but uh, an amateur called Mark Mays, he's a poet and, uh, and has a band. I don't know what he does during the daytime. Well, maybe surf internet or whatever. Uh, he's been in totally obsessed with this case, dug into it, and he has got a totally uh, um, believable hypothesis, which is that the guy from, uh, the guy from Wales knew the doctors, they're all paediatricians. I mean, they even have a conference. The Welsh paediatricians have a conference in, in Chester. Uh, there are lots of reasons why these people could be connected. How come a paediatrician suddenly turned up at, with the police offering his services? And which, which cases had the police got? And who gave them to them? Uh, who gave them? Who gave them to them? Well, we know that the it was finally the police, sorry, the hospital was stupid enough to inform the police rather than to get a forensic institute to do a forensic investigation. You should not ask police to do a forensic investigation because they were looking for somebody to put in jail. And that's not necessarily what you need a forensic investigation for. But um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the dossiers, medical dossiers, which the hospital gave to the police, consisted of all the deaths in the period when Lucy was there and all the resuscitations in that period 
when she was there, when she was there, if you see what I mean, right? Which happened while she was actually in the ward. So this is, uh, this is a Texas sharpshooter, right? This is painting a target around a person. Look, look, she was there, she was all, she was, I mean, this is, a, this is the table I show, spreadsheet I showed you at the beginning. It, it's, it's, it's a construct, it's artificial. It's a tiny biased selection from a huge database. And if the police must have had all the data, uh, they could have found out that the death rate was equally high when Lucy wasn't there. Now, another thing is, nobody knows how many resuscitations there were when Lucy wasn't there because they are not centrally registered. It isn't a category. It's not put into the databases. You have to go through the medical files, right? And nobody has done that. Only the doctors have done that for when Lucy was there. Right. Okay. So well, we should I should stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. I could go on for several hours. Well, yeah, that's also start a bit late. But, uh, so we started a bit early. As we should start by pausing the rate chart. So in view of the time, of course, we just have one or two questions and then move to the lounge where there will be drinks and one can continue uh, well with more questions, of course. Yeah. How were the defense attorneys uh, assigned in this case? Because uh, they have done a very poor job. Uh, yeah, they had did a very poor job. So uh, you in England, you have you uh, a person who's accused of a crime goes to a solicitor, which is like a low level kind of lawyer. Uh, and Lucy went to the solicitor's office in uh, in Chester, which she had used for buying her house, right? And this, um, uh, yeah, office, uh, this, this business with this law business has got a few people who do who do criminal cases, so they assigned her a guy, and I think he probably thought she was guilty when he got to see all the evidence and stuff, and. His job is to collect expert experts and collect all the evidence together from the on the defense side. And that is then given to a barrister, that's the guy with the wig, who does the theatrics in court. So the barrister often does not even get to see the client. Well, until they're in the court together. Uh, uh, and those are two things. So now there are also big problems for the defense because there's almost no money. Another problem is uh, in England, no medical expert is ever going to want to act for the defense in a case where babies are supposed to have been killed. I mean, real experts in England have told me this and lawyers. You have to go to America. You have to get very expensive American experts. You have to know which experts to get, right? Because uh, it was all about pediatrics, but the expertise of which the prosecution brought in was from toxicologists and endocrinologists and several other specialisms. And uh, I mean, they had the prosecution had been working on the case for five years, right? And collecting suitable experts for hire. I mean, they got some people who. This idiot guy from Wales gave them a hypothesis for each case, and then they got some expert to sort of sign off what the other one had done. But uh, um, so I think, uh, uh, given the situation in England and the way that these things are done, Lucy did not have a chance. So I understand that the defense put up a terribly poor, poor show. I mean, they, they did find one expert pediatrician, and he went to a pre trial meeting. And he was confronted with five other experts, and they were all talking about endocrinology and toxicology and so on. And he said, sorry, I don't know anything about this. So like they did what they could do. And they didn't get any material they could do much with. Yeah. So that's the answer. An answer. Maybe one more question, and then uh, you move to lunch. Well, yeah, perfect. So yeah, when we talk about statistics, already when I when I read sort of the abstract, the first thing that that I was wondering is maybe a very obvious question. Even if you come up with a number like one in a hundred thousand, yeah, it's awfully low. Yeah, 
But again, we know we have many, many nurses working around the world. Yeah, yeah. This number is, it's, it's possibly quite likely that you yeah. will see a very coincidental relationship somewhere. So yes. that's a fact that I was wondering if, if those numbers should even be allowed to put well, in a case like that at all. Uh, yeah, um, okay, whether or not they should be allowed is like for the lawyers to describe yeah. that, but scientists could certainly could and should and do actually argue against them. Now, one of the things I did for Lu for Lucia was that I redid the, 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 the calculations, which they won the 342 million. And I found out that under some, I think, decent assumptions and making some corrections, necessary corrections to the data and correcting the methodology, because the guy had multiplied three p-values and treated it like a p-value. I mean, it was technically speaking, it was stupid what he'd done. Uh, I came up with one in 50. And the one in 50, which I had, was very important for explaining to investigative journalists and to medical scientists to correct the impression which the one in 342 million had made. Yeah. And something similar was also the case in, in the Italian nurse I helped get out of jail. Because there, some stupid statistician had come up with some incredible number and, and a calculation of Daniela uh, Poggiali must have probably murdered a hundred people, although she was only murdered with two, only, sorry, tried for two murders, but the statistical evidence said she probably killed a hundred. And it was important to uh, like destroy that evidence. Um, so you cannot do this by, you, you can't change the rules. You have to, uh, you have to educate the defense lawyers. And you have to work for the defense lawyers, well, for the, you have to work on these cases and show a number of times how these numbers have led to disasters. Now, in England, there was the Sally Clark case, which is a famous cop death case, as in, uh, which was a, a, like a professional woman who had whose three babies, one after the other, had died of a, a sudden infant death syndrome, at least that's so it appeared. I mean, they were suddenly dead in the cradle. Terrible. And a very famous pediatrician called Roy Meadows, uh, and who has actually made a, a, a profession out of this, he said, look, the chance of SIDS is one in 600 or something. Uh, therefore, the chance of two SIDS is one in 600 squared. Therefore, the chance of three SIDS is one in 600 cubed, right? And Meadows' law is like, like one can happen, two is suspicious, three is impossible. Right now, that guy got, uh, uh, well, he was responsible for an enormous miscarriage of justice and statisticians were instrumental in fighting for that case to get reopened uh, and eventually it was reopened. Yes, and just to finish, medical evidence saved, exonerated the mother. So it's an incredible balance of like, the statistics, the bad statistics gets people into jail Good medicine gets them out of jail in some cases, especially if they're innocent, <laughs> as far as I know. And um, you must work on both sides. I think my point would be even, even good statistics gets people in jail because it easily gets misinterpreted. Yeah. Way. Well, I use I used good statistics to get two Hezbollah yeah, terrorists I... in jail. Really? Yeah. So I think we should. Uh, right. <laughs> it's um, <laughs> Let's fall again. Thank you very much. Sorry for the length. So there are, there are breaks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, right. So this is mine. You always get shares of talks. In, uh, you always get shares of talks in, in trouble. Okay? Right. 